So today I'm going to talk about privacy tools, uh, which is basically just any anything to connect to the internet, uh, just with privacy in mind. So today, well, it says agenda, but it's more like things you want, I want you to keep in mind, um, just or questions I want you to answer. Uh, first off, what is privacy? Um, you know, just define privacy in your own terms, and then criteria for the tools. Uh, for what you would uh, choose, um, and I'll probably talk a little bit about what I like care about in terms of uh, criteria, and trade-offs as in what would you give up for your privacy, and then thirdly, why should you care? And that's pretty uh, objective so, or subjective, so yeah, you determine that yourself. Uh, so my name is Masaki. I'm a second-year CSEC student, and uh, I don't have any pictures, so I asked my friends for them and. Yeah, that and a couple others that I was told to take down. <laughs> um, so first off, let's talk about privacy. And uh, who here knows the difference between privacy uh, and security? I think that was no one. Oh, yeah, Alex? <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, mine's sort of along those lines. Uh, privacy is more like selectively sharing your data or like choosing what data uh, you want to share. And then security is more like uh, more of a dealing who has access to that data. And today I want to talk more about privacy, what you can do to, um, to take control of your own data. And, well, let me ask a question. Who covers their laptop webcam with a tape? Can see by raise of hands? Quite a few of you. I should have guessed, but. <laughs> uh, tape is fine, or, or whatever to cover your camera. Like, so the thing with that is, I mean, with tape, usually you're not actually physically disconnecting the camera from your laptop, right? You're just putting a piece of tape on there. Right, so that's what I mean by moderation. There's limits to what you would do, but you know you would rather give up the ability to use the camera than uh, uh, y like give up your own privacy. So that's what I mean by trade-off is that you're giving up that use of the camera. And then thirdly is ease of access. Well, everybody can pick up a piece of tape from anywhere and just put it over their camera. It's not that hard. And I think most importantly is the idea of trust, because you trust that piece of tape more than anybody else who would uh, be accessing your camera, be it companies, manufacturers, or even the government. And as far as you know, tape doesn't have any ulterior motives to sell your data. So with that out of the way, um, let's move on to operating systems. So I know some of you are die-hard oh, like fans for whatever OS you use, especially the Arch Linux people. But, uh, <laughs> um, so generally, I won't say this for the rest of it, but like, I'm going to say here that the most popular ones, like Mac OS and Windows, are probably not the best in terms of privacy. Um, I'll explain that a little bit later. But what I uh, do suggest are some of these. Um, so if you see on the furthest right, those two are Fedora and Ubuntu. Both of them are open source and free, and they're pretty lightweight, especially in compared to uh, Windows. And they are active, uh, they're developed pretty actively, uh, so you can trust them pretty well. And uh, so the next two, the purple one is uh, Tails Linux, and the one that looks like a padlock is uh, Hunix. Both of them basically are, uh, they work in pretty the same way. Uh, they route ev all their network, uh, networking through Tor. Uh, Tails Linux, you can run off a USB drive. It doesn't use your hard drive at all, so uh, it's pretty secure in that way. It only uses your RAM. Um, Hunix is a bit different. It uses VirtualBox, and uh, it runs on your computer. And so someone in the similar vein, but 
a little bit more secure is CubeOS. It's a bit extreme, um, but basically it runs off the Zen Type 1 hypervisor, and uh, which just means that the VMs run off the bare metal. And it's a bit difficult to explain. Uh, so their motto is security by isolation. And what they do is they run everything in a uh, virtual machine. So the administrator is its own virtual machine. And then the GUI is also handled by its own virtual machine. Uh, on top of that, there's an application virtual machine, uh, which is, runs off templates. Um, uh, those are called cubes. Uh, you can have your work cube, your school cube, and whatever else cube, uh, and so on and so forth. It also uses uh, Hunix. Uh, Hunix is built into uh, CubeOS just in case you want to do any uh, secure browsing. Um, and yeah, so CubeOS, I tried messing around with it a little bit, and it was pretty difficult. <laughs> so, uh, which leads me to the last point that it doesn't really matter what you choose just as long as you think you can trust it and whatever you feel comfortable with. And so what I suggest is something open source and free. So you can use that if you want. <laughs> okay, and I know some of you still want to use Windows and Mac OS, so I do have some things that might help. Uh, so the first two, Shut Up 10++ uh, and Portmaster are both for Windows, I think Portmaster also works for Linux. I'm not sure about Mac. Um, uh, but shut up 10 plus plus is just uh, closed source uh, software. And this is like one of the two uh, closed source things I will um, recommend here. But uh, it works by on Windows 10 and Windows 11. Um, it tries its best to block telemetry um, and fingerprinting. Uh, and as you can see there, there's a bunch of different uh, options you can turn off. Uh, mainly just going to be advertising, which, I mean, I assume most of you don't want any ads. And yeah, so that, this only works for Windows, but it is uh, pretty useful. The next one is Portmaster. Uh, basically, it's sort of like a firewall. It sees all your network traffic, and you can block certain types. Uh, whatever you want to block. And so usually, so it also uh, forwards all your DNS traffic through DNS over TLS. So who here knows uh, what DNS stands for? Ashley? <laughs> yeah, so basically, like you said, it's just a service that assigns IPs to host names. But if you ever looked at a Wireshark capture of DNS, you can see that the message or what you looked up is available for anyone to see as long as they have access to the network or they saw the packet. Which means that, um, and what this does is DNS over TLS. TLS is transport layer security. Um, basically, it encrypts the DNS uh, packet so people can't see whatever you're doing. I don't know what you're doing. Um, but. So I like this one mainly because it's pretty easy to use and it looks pretty, <laughs> that's all it. Um, they also have a service called uh, SVP, I think, which is um, you either pay 100 euros a year or if you're good at math, uh, 10 euros a month. Um, so basically it's like a, <laughs> it took you long enough. Uh, it's, it's similar to a VPN, except that VPNs aren't actually built for security. So what they wanted to build is this uh, networking feature that would be based solely upon uh, security. And uh, I don't have a picture here, but basically what they claim is that it's much more secure than VPNs. It's very easy to use, and uh, it automatically gets around geo-blocking, which is where uh, most, a lot of websites can block certain content from you based on where you are. And what they claim is that it automatically, automatically gets around that by choosing the uh, node that's closest to whatever server you're trying to connect to. And finally is uh, privacy.sexy. Okay, there it is. Um, so this is a website. Uh, there, the GitHub project is also available. Um, this is open source. So as it says on the top, it says enforce privacy uh, and security on Windows and Mac OS. 
Um, it has Windows and Mac OS, but it also works for Linux, Linux, as you can see on the bottom. You can visit the website. All you do is you click on whatever folder you think you need, and um, you just copy and paste the script, I'm pretty sure. And yeah, it's very easy to use, especially for Mac OS, since getting uh, any application uh, audited for uh, Mac is very difficult, or the App Store is difficult. So this is a good option for people who want to use Mac OS. So speaking of uh, VPNs, so I think VPNs, so VPNs aren't actually built for privacy. They have private in their name, but that doesn't mean, it's not private for privacy, it's more like private as in private uh, property. What they, it was initially an experiment to see if they could connect two far away uh, networks together. Um, but they have their uses in, in terms of privacy and you can con uh, combine that with other networking features to make it much better. So VPN is slightly useful. So its uses is that it protects your information from your ISP or your internet service provider because that content that passes through is all encrypted. Uh, however, um, it doesn't exactly encrypt that data going to wherever you want to talk to it because if it was, it wouldn't be able to read it. Uh, but it does protect some of your information from wherever you want to reach because uh, the source or the, the source address uh, will all be that VPN server. So I think, uh, but the rest of the information such as where you are, what device you're using will probably be, probably be your own, uh, mainly because, well, websites need that to, in order to work. Um, so a VPN is usually something you would use if you trust that VPN of your internet service provider or if you wanna hide things from your net network administrators. Uh, examples of uh, problems you can get around is uh, throttling because sometimes uh, networks can slow down your network, uh, uh, your networking speeds on based on what you're doing, such as gaming or streaming. Uh, you can also get around censorship based on where you are. I doubt that any of you have that issue, but you, know, you can get around that. And also you can get around geo-blocking. Like uh, I said before, uh, you can choose a server that's not where you are and get around uh, people blocking what content you can see. Uh, that being said, uh, VPNs haven't been the most reliable, especially the free ones. Um, some notable uh, leaks have been I'm going for most recent is uh, Winscribe. It's a pretty popular v, uh, free VPN. Um, yeah, but in July 2021, they, uh, they said that uh, they gave up some user data to Ukrainian police. Um, NordVPN in October 2019 uh, said that some people had unauthorized access to a server for a while. Uh, Facebook VPN um, on January 2019 uh, released a statement saying that they use that data for uh, moder uh, moder moder what? monitoring their users because it's Facebook. And Verizon also released a um, VPN called Safe Wi-Fi, which in their uh, terms of service, they wrote down that they will use that personal info for marketing purposes. So not all VPNs can be trusted. You have to do your own research. Um, another bit that you have to consider is the Five Eyes, which is just five countries that uh, agree to share their surveillance information. This would be the US, the UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. And there's a, uh, though there were extensions to this group, such as the Nine Eyes, which contained four other countries, including uh, Netherlands, uh, and then 14 Eyes, which adds five, five more. And, uh, so mainly, the Five Eyes was initially made as uh, a treaty to, during the Cold War to sort of give uh, each other info about mainly uh, the Soviet Union. However, that sort of changed, especially in 2008, uh, based on the War, of uh, the war on Terror. Uh, they would mainly uh, exchange details about uh, terrorists. Um, but over time, it sort of extended to sharing information about uh, people and, or like people within the country based on what, whatever illegal activities they've done. 
Um, the Five Eyes also have some beef with China because in 2018 they arrested some journalist in China and then China in retaliation arrested three Canadian journalists. I don't know what happened to them. Um, and yeah, so that being said, here are some VPNs I uh, recommend. And so I'm gonna go from cheapest to most expensive. Uh, Surfshark is based in Netherlands, which is technically part of Nine Eyes, but it is cheapest at $48 a year. It, it has been audited by a German uh, company called Cure53, and it's decently fast compared to most free versions, uh, free VPNs. Uh, second is NordVPN. It's based in Pan uh, Panama. You can also use Bitcoin to buy the service if you want to be extra secure. Uh, it is closed sourced. Uh, however, it has been audited and it probably is one of the best services because it also includes threat protection. Um, and there's a password manager as well, I think, recently. And all of that for $60 a year. Uh, Proton VPN. Uh, so this is a freemium uh, VPN. Uh, you can either get the free version, which is only available in three countries, or pay 72 euros a year to get access to all 64 and slightly faster networking. Um, I suggest that you also maybe get the or check out the Proton Mail. It's also a very... Uh, good alternative to Google if you don't like Google. Um, they have their own ca uh, calendar and drive option as well. So hide.me is uh, another VPN based in Malaysia. They take Monero, they're $80 a, a year. And they're also audited. I mean, all these have been audited because, well, they make enough money to pay for um, auditing. And finally, it's ExpressVPN, which is the red one up there. It's the most expensive at $100 a year. However, they cover the most amount of uh, uh, devices. It's based in the British Virgin Islands. Um, they can cover from consoles to smart TVs to even routers. You can connect to uh, ExpressVPN, which I think is pretty novel. It's uh, not something anything uh, any other of these can do. And the last one is called Sentinel. This one's a free VPN, but I think the concept is uh, pretty interesting. What they want to do is they want to decentralize the VPN. So uh, all the VPN servers are hosted by users. Um, it, it is a bit of a pain to set up. In um, Linux and Mac, once you download the uh, VPN like software, you have to set it up through CLI and or the command line interface. But all of the... All, uh, Linux, Windows, and Mac OS have a browser that automatically um, transports all the networking through uh, the VPN. And as of right now, I think they have around 4,000 nodes, so you don't have to worry too much about connectivity. So finally, I want to talk uh, about browsers. It's the last part of your internet privacy because, so I worked in the summer uh, at our internship, and I was in charge for a couple days of making a report about Google Analytics. And what I noticed is that, well, they can obviously tell what OS you're using, what browser, and what screen size, because, well, this is all just on your device. But in addition to that, they know your location, they can guess your gender and age, and also what kind of habits you have, right? And this is what uh, part of what's called uh, fingerprinting. So fingerprinting is basically determining how unique you are based on a bunch of factors. So who here uses, uh, oh, first off, who here has a smartphone? I'm assuming that's all of you. Right? Well, that's not very specific. But um, out of those people, who has an Apple smartphone? That's slightly less. And then out of those people, who uses Chrome on their Apple smartphone? Yeah, I, I don't think that's even available. But, um, <laughs> uh, but just like that, you can narrow uh, people down based on what they have, what they use. And that's what's called fingerprinting. And based on that, um, you can determine who they are, what kind of habits they have, and if you sign into whatever 
um, like Google or Facebook, it, it's much easier to assign that to a face, to a name, to whatever you put on your calendar. And that's part of what's in uh, identifying information. Now, big data, or people, the companies that handle large amounts of data don't really care what you personally do. But if you can assign an ID to that, if you can assign a name to that, that's when it becomes dangerous because when there are leaks such as uh, email leaks, IP leaks, password leaks, people can assign that data of what you've been looking up or what you've been doing to a name. And that brings a couple of security issues. And oh, what the heck? Uh, this is also for um, uh, desktops. The sad part about this is uh, Edge beats out Firefox, which I don't know, who uses Edge? Um, so I'm sad about that because I personally use uh, Firefox. Uh, uh, but in order to try and prevent these uh, fingerprinting, you know, all these issues, I have all of these extensions. <laughs> I'm not going to go through every single one. A lot of these are just you pretend to be a someone else or you're making sure the connection is secure, or you're trying to make sure that Facebook and Google don't know that much about you. Um, and then there's an ad block, because I don't like ads. Um, but there's a bunch of other browsers that work um, just out of the box with a bunch of security features. So the blue hexagon is what I mentioned before. It's the browser called dcenter. Uh, it's spelled D-E-C-N-T-R, because they're edgy. Um, it's based on Chromium. Uh, it uses a Sentinel VPN, uh, Sentinel VPN to route all their network. And uh, it also has a built-in crypto wallet and a pretty clean uh, browser. There's also LibreWolf, which is a modified Firefox. It basically does all of what I did to my Firefox, but you know, just out of the box. And, and because it's just a modified Firefox, it's not, it doesn't look terrible. Um, there's also uh, Brave, which is the lion. I know some of you use that. Um, Brave has its own search engine, which uh, is pretty good, especially even compared to DuckDuckGo. It doesn't, uh, they both block trackers as much as possible. However, DuckDuckGo is based off of Bing search, and no one uses Bing. So I like Brave search a bit more. Um, Brave also has a function called Brave Talk, I think. It's basically like Zoom, and uh, as far as functio functionality goes, it's basically the same. Uh, I think it's pretty fast as well. And finally, there's Tor. If you don't know what that is, um, don't look it up, because apparently the US government tracks you if you visit their website and download it. But um, Tor networking basically works by um, uh, passing your uh, information through a bunch of uh, nodes and wrapping your uh, information in, in encryption layers, hence the onion. Um, but the issue is it's, it's a bit overkill. It can make your networking slightly slower. And also, the Tor browser was developed by the Navy, so they have their ways to you know, try and track you back if what you're doing is too bad. Um, so personally, I use Firefox and Brave, because Brave I use for my school stuff, Firefox I use for everything else, mainly because, well, I mean, it will be harder to try and identify that the person who goes to the school is different from the person who uses Firefox. So on Brave, I look like a really di diligent student that only visits RIT websites and does some research from time to time. And on uh, mobile, there's a bunch of browsers as well. Uh, so the top one, the purple Firefox logo is just Firefox Focus. Um, and then the next one is DuckDuckGo browser. Those are pretty two, uh, those two are pretty similar in uh, functionalities. Uh, they both have a dedicated button to clear all of your data or your, all your history and uh, password cache. And, uh, but one issue with DuckDuckGo, uh, recently they announced, or I forgot who announced it, but DuckDuckGo has an issue, well, they, claim that they uh, block most uh, trackers. However, the DuckDuckGo mobile um, browser
as an issue where they have a do not compete with Microsoft, so it doesn't actually block uh, Microsoft trackers. Uh, another option for Android users is uh, Bromite. Um, it's a it's a browser based on Chromium, it's, which is just an open source version of uh, Chrome OS. Um, I've never used it because I don't have Android, but I assume some of you can try it. And then finally, uh, there's the Onion browser, which is the iOS version of the Tor browser, uh, which just uses Tor networking for iOS. Um, some issues with that may be that uh, because of iOS limitations, it doesn't network all of your traffic through the Tor browser, or the Tor network, and also it, not even all of the network that you pass through the browser itself can be, or is going to go through the Tor network. And yeah, that's about it. Are there any questions? Yes. So browser-wise, I use Brave, um, Firefox, and Firefox Focus. I think the Tor browser is a bit overkill for, I mean, I'm not doing anything that needs the Tor browser, so um, I don't use that. I think, I mean, if you use Firefox, you can easily use uh, LibreWolf, which is basically the same. It just takes away like, stuff like sign-ins. I mean, the add-ons still work because it's just modified. Um, I mean, if you care about security enough that to use LibreWolf, I don't think you care too much about signing into Firefox. Um, in terms of, oh, this I use, uh, I use iOS and Windows, and also a Linux device. But in terms of VPN, um, I messed around with Proton VPN a while ago. Um, I also used Winscribe, but that's free, so it's not useful. That uh, not that useful. Um, I've been on a NordVPN subscription because I forgot to cancel and cancel it. Uh, but uh, it's been working pretty well. I haven't had any issues with it. Uh, what else? I use this one because, I mean, I personally just feel like Windows runs slightly better when I turn off everything or not everything, everything that I can without breaking stuff. But uh, yeah, because Windows is a bit bloated. <laughs> um, in terms of OSs, I definitely don't use this one. Uh, I don't know what this is. Um, some of you can use it, I don't care. Um, I've used Ubuntu before for labs. Uh, my laptop here runs Mint. Um, Tails, I don't have a USB for that, but uh, I've used CubeOS before. It's pretty difficult, um, especially if you want to do anything other than browsing the web or word processing, because GPU pass-throughs is also a security issue, so they disallow it by default. They also, it's really difficult to get Windows 10 on there as well. It's, uh, by default, it has Windows 7, but it's Windows 7, so I never use that. And yeah, that's about it. And there's other stuff I, would, I use, um, but I don't know, that'll go too long. Uh, yes. Yep. Yeah, so like I said before, like it doesn't matter um, what you use as, as long as you yourself can trust it. And personally, um, in terms of VPNs, I'm going to go over there. Like I can trust these. And the thing about uh, paid VPNs is they make enough money to be able to be audited. And because the auditing process is pretty expensive to pay another company to make sure that your security is on like up to par. And all of these, other than NordVPN, is open source. So anybody can actually look at the code, I think. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I think it's a, I think with most free VPNs, the issue is that it's very difficult to get an active development team because they don't have much incentive other than this is the right thing to do, right? 
And with these, you can just pay people to uh, you know, do their job. I hope that answered your question. Uh, okay. Uh, right now, I only have the SRA lanyard. <laughs> Thank you very much.